So I want to take a look at these two alternative definitions of the limit superior, um, relate them back to our understanding of the sequence example from the group assignment, um, and get a little bit of practice, first of all, understanding why they're defining the same thing as our original definition, and our original definition is the supremum of the limit set, right? Why are these two new definitions defining the same thing for us? Um, and then what's the intuition? Um, why, do they, why do they work uh, in the way that we want them to work? So depending on which textbook author you happen to pick up, most textbooks in analysis use one or the other of these as their original definition. Most do not use the supremum of the limit set as I have. Um, so let's look at them kind of one at a time, starting with the first. So we decided based on our original definition of limit superior that we thought that the lim sup of this sequence, again, formula for this sequence is uh, n over n plus 1 times the sine of n pi over 4. We decided that the limb soup of this sequence was equal to 1. And in our original definition, the reason we decided that is that we actually found, we literally found a subsequence, subsequence at the tops of all of these Christmas trees, marching off toward infinity, a subsequence that actually converges to the number 1, since and I'm going to write this as the limit of s sub 2 plus 8k as k tends to infinity. That was the sequence that, um, that, that we picked out last time. The limit of that subsequence is equal to 1, and this is the largest possible, largest subsequential limit possible in this example. So that's why we said that the limb soup was equal to 1. Um, let's look at another way that we could have made that determination. So before we talk about the limb soup of this sequence again, um, I want to draw a contrast. What if I were to ask you, what is the soup of this sequence, the supremum of all of my SNs? What is the least upper bound that I can place on all of these terms? What do you think? So the least upper bound of all terms in this sequence we'd really be asking for sort of what's the lowest ceiling that I could place that would bound all the terms of the sequence underneath that ceiling. Right. So 2 is definitely an upper bound, but so is 1.4, so is 1.2. 1 is indeed an upper bound on every single term in this sequence. And if I try to choose any bound which is less than 1, I'm going to be able to find some terms which are greater than that one. So, one is indeed the supremum of the set of all terms in this sequence. So then the question that you might ask, I know the question that I asked when I was first learning this stuff, is, well, why, why is limb soup not always the same thing as the supremum? Because in this example, it does turn out that that's the case. Is this always true? So can we think of can we think of an example of how we might change this sequence just a little bit um, so that the limb soup is still equal to one? In other words, one is still the largest subsequential limit, but that the supremum is no longer one. Can you think of a way to maybe what we, what would we have to do? We would have to create it so that some of the terms in the sequence are bigger than one, and yet the limb soup is still equal to one. So how might I accomplish that? So I've changed just a couple terms in the sequence, right? At least by, by visual, I changed, looks like, just these first couple, and then my Christmas tree pattern starts, right? and it continues. So what now would you say is the supremum of this sequence? The supremum, the low, greatest, sorry, the least upper bound on all terms. What do you think? I'm tripping on this stuff here. So my supremum now the lowest ceiling that I can place on my entire sequence, yeah, it's somewhere in the, somewhere in the neighborhood of one point, at least according to this, it looks like it's between 1.4 and 1.6. Um, so it's, it's whatever, it happens to be whatever the, the value of that second term, actually it's the first term, whatever the value of this first term happens to be. Um, my grapher is telling me that that's about 1.45. So in this example now, it looks as though that number 
is the supremum of my entire sequence. But what's the limit supremum? Limit superior, rather. What's the limb soup going to be? Limb soup is still one. Why is the limb soup still one? Why, why are these terms over here, which are bigger than one, no longer a problem uh, once we think about limb soup instead of supremum? The biggest difference between supremum and limit superior is that the supremum has to take into account all the terms in the sequence. The limit superior only cares about limiting behavior, asymptotic behavior. It only cares what happens eventually as we go way out toward the horizon along the x-axis, what's happening. And so the limit superior is only tasked, well, let me put it this way, the limit superior is not tasked with caring about any behavior that happens for only finitely many terms. Any behavior that happens for only finitely many terms, the limit superior is not going to see. But the supremum might, and in this case does. So here, this leads me into our first alternative definition for limb soup. Let's try and, from this picture, recover the number one as the limit superior uh, using a different kind of definition. So here's the new idea. The new idea is we want to use that lowest ceiling notion that we started with in thinking about the supremum of the entire sequence, but not apply that notion to the entire sequence, but only apply it to behavior that we can observe in the tails of the sequence. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll start by saying, what is the supremum of all of the terms in this sequence starting from term number one? So what that's going to do is it's going to give me the supremum, and then we would write it like this, the supremum for n greater than or equal to 1 of Sn. Starting from the first term and going all the way out to infinity, what's the supremum? Well, that's going to be the 1.45 whatever it was that was the value of this first term. But that doesn't give me the limit supremum. That just gives me one measurement of a ceiling. That gives me one ceiling. So then what I would do next is go up a little. Maybe, mm, I don't want to go all the way to 7 if I can avoid it. Let me just go to 2. Okay. And now ask the question, for all the terms beginning from the second term and going out to infinity, what's the supremum? So supremum n greater than or equal to 2 of Sn. What's that going to be approximately based on this graph? Yeah, I can drop my ceiling a little bit because I no longer have that first term getting in the way. I can drop my ceiling down to 1.4, 1.2. Can't quite go to 1, but somewhere between 1 and 1.2. So I'll ask the grapher again. 1.073 is an approximation for that. So what that does is it gives me the next measurement, the supremum for n greater than or equal to 2 of Sn, 1.073. So that's lower than the first ceiling that we placed on it, but it's not yet all the way down to 1 for our sequence. So we keep going. Right? We, we, we move our, our horizontal line over there out one more place. We move it to 3 instead. I ask, what's the supremum now of the terms which are shaded to the right of that line? And now what would you say? These two terms are out of the running. And we're back to our Christmas trees again. What's the lowest ceiling that I can place on those? I think it's one, right? And so this is an example of a sequence where starting from the third tail and then for all the rest of the tails, it turns out that, that supremum is going to be equal to one. Okay. So this definition of limit supremum, limit superior, what it does is it tells us to start with all the tails n greater than or equal to k of Sn, right? So tell me what is the, the lowest ceiling I can place on the first tail, then the second tail, then the third tail, then the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and so on, and so on, and so on. Each of those tails might have different suprema. But as we proceed forward, those ceilings are going to get lower and lower and lower. And the sequence of those ceilings is therefore going to be a decreasing sequence. And what do we know about monotonically decreasing sequences? Given that this sequence has some terms and therefore will also have a lower bound on how 
far down we can put that ceiling, what we get is a sequence of suprema that are decreasing and bounded from below. So what must they do? They must converge by the monotone convergence theorem. And therefore, this limit, as k tends to infinity, is going to exist. And now we can see where limb soup gets its name. Right? It's the limit of the convergent sequences of these lowest ceilings on the tails as the tail gets further and further and further out. Um, so this is a reason that we call it a limb soup. Right? It's, it's what happens to these ceilings as we continually drop them because we're ignoring more and more terms from the head of the sequence. Um, the other thing that we know, but because of the monotone convergence theorem, is that because this sequence is monotonically decreasing and bounded, we also know that the limit is going to be the same thing as the infimum. So in a way, this is saying that the limb soup is the smallest among all of the lowest ceilings that we can place on the tails of the sequence. So that's a mouthful, but that's the technical read on what's happening in this form of the definition. Right? So we put a ceiling on the whole sequence, and then we say, all right, now ignore the first term. Now put the next lowest ceiling on it. Now ignore the second term, put the next lowest ceiling on it. Keep going, keep going, keep going. What is the lowest among all those lowest ceilings that we can get? Uh, in that process. And that's what we then call the limb suit.